joining us today, we have Yvonne Michael, the daughter of the late, very reverend Father Mina Nematala, and she's going to be sharing with us her experiences about the 50 years in Australia and her journey coming out to Australia. Yvonne, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susie. So establishing then that, that first church with the community that was already here would have been um, a lot of help needed. So how did um, your father or Father Mina get everyone together and say, I need a person in charge of this, I need a person to organise this? Being in the, in the army, he was very yeah, organised. Yeah, he was very, said. as I said, he was very mm -hmm. organised. He was, he had a, an authority and he had a, a very uh, good personality. People, of course, got attached to him and he used to say, instead of, we have Ashaya as well, and he started to organize the people and they listened to him. Of course, there was some opposition and uh, people wanted to do their own way. They've been here for uh, a few years and they wanted to be, you know, we're here first, so we wanted to tell you what to do. But he wouldn't accept that. He would tell them, this is what we will do, and, you know, like in a nice way. And they accepted that. Even, you know, sometimes it's very simple matter like the ladies and the, the men, they were together. He said, no, in the mass, he let them do it. But then after that, he said, as from tomorrow, when we pray the mass, you, the girls will stand this side and the boys will stand that side. And this is the deacon's area. And everybody was ready. And he said, when we have a bishop, we will ordain more deacons. Because, of course, there's some of them are not deacons. And... Um, his, uh, there's the first couple he did wedding at Cleveland before we moved to church. There's a few wedding it happened in that hall and he had all the icons, all the pictures, everything. So we kind of did it as a, it looked presentable as a church. So we stayed there for a few years and we did everything, baptism, marriage, everything. So he organised people into um, helping and, and pulling things together with getting things established. Yes. So that was all in, in Redfern, in, was Yes, it? Redfern. Yeah. And after Redfern, where was the next church? Uh, Sydenham was the first church. That's an interesting subject about the name of the church. The name of the church was St Mary. And when uh, Pope Carolus ordained Dad, he said, OK, we will call you Father Mina to go and build a church of, by St Mina. He said, all right. So when he came here, there was, of course, a committee. They said, uh, you know, we've already formed it and uh, it's registered by the name of St. Mary. He said, OK, St. Mary and St. Mina. So we gathered the two uh, because Pope Corolla said it was St. Mina, but the people here already formed a, a community and registered the name by St. Mary. He said, OK, we'll call that church St. Mary and St. Mina. And that was the first church, it was a Methodist church. So a Methodist church that they used for the masses of the, the Coptic Orthodox. Masses. Yes, yes, yes. And then from Sydenham, how how quickly then did you see the congregation expanding? And I know that that's where Sunday school started and things like that. So yes, So how quickly yes. did things start to happen? Um, Sydenham had a, a like as I said, it was a church, so it had the the top level or the street level. Um, as a church, and downstairs there was the kitchen and rooms and facilities for Sunday school. And this is where we used to have our all ages of Sunday schools. After the mass, they go down and they have something to eat and then um, attend Sunday school. Uh, interesting part is my dad kept doing the Urban for all this for a long, long time, many, many years. He does the Hamel and the Baraka for the people. He used to stay till after two o'clock just to do the urban, and he used to do it by himself. Sometimes he'd get help from my brothers, but he used to do it till, you know, he makes sure it's perfect for the offering. And then he started to organize a few, um, like outing, so the people get to know them, um, each other, and the, because the, most of the families, um, they came by themselves too, so they didn't have any other families. So it was really good. Um, to see that the people have a link between each other and they talk to each other and they share their problems and they share their happiness. Uh, there was a link in the community. Uh, we used to be on a very regular basis. And I think people used to look forward for that because this is the only time they get to see each other and talk their own language and talk on the same level that everybody would understand. Mm. So you then finished your high schooling here in Australia and then you went on to do any further education? Did you go straight to work? 
I went to work, but interesting, I went to work when I, I was in year 11. And that was a big thing. <laughs> and, you know, like you just walk in and you ask, you want to do some work. And that was very easy. They take anybody, even from re year nine, you can, you get to work. And it was a lot of work at that time. There was no hassle at all. You leave this job and you go to the next one and you'll get, will ac get accepted. Not like today. There wasn't any competition at all. And even the number of people, even the Australian people, there wasn't that many at all. There wasn't any traffic. The roads were really good and clear. So it's a, it's a different era. <laughs> Yeah, different era. it sounds like it. So yeah. that all happened in the 70s. Yes. And in the 70s then, were there more churches that were established and more priests that uh, were ordained? Yes. Uh, what happened is dad never had a day off, whether he was sick, whether he wants the holiday. He used to go out with the congregation, as I said, during the weekend on a Saturday or a Sunday after church. And um, I think it was after at least a good four, five, five years, 75. I think so more than five years when he requested um, a break not from the church of course just to have a break with the family and uh, uh, from all this overwhelming people so I think uh, Pop Shinoda was the, the present Pope at the moment and he um, ordained uh, um, I think Father Musa I think he was a priest in Alexandria as well he came over so that can have the time off but before then, two, um, two priests came, Father Johanna, the late Father Johanna Sabbath, and Father Mina, who went to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And then Father Musa came, so Dad can go on holiday. So he never had any day off, even if he's sick, he, he used to go. Wow. He, he was very, very full on dedicated. Mm. Yes, very so adamant. He was a very, very hard worker. He was. We uh, know he was. and. Um, Looking ahead then, so that happened in the 70s, looking ahead in the 80s, I know that um, a lot more churches started to become mm -hmm. more established, St. Yeah. George in yes. Kensington. He so served at St. George as well, yeah. and, and then he went to St. Anthony in St. Paula, Guildford, and then he went to the Saint, uh, Archangel Michael and St. Bishoy, that's the last one, and this is where he had a rest. Yeah. So let's um, look back then. Is there any part of your life where you think, oh, I wish I never left Egypt and came to Australia? Any hard times that you had to face mm -hmm. here that made you think, I didn't, I didn't want to come, mm. it would have been easier if we didn't come? Well, as I said, it was exciting because I was a teenager. I want to discover, I want to see what's this Australia all about. But after a few years, you realise you're on your own. There's no family at all. We didn't have any family in here. So it was really hard. And we had a, a nanny as well. She used to do all the things. Although mom used to do everything, but it was too hard for her. I could see she wasn't very happy physically because, and she used to get a lot of migraine because it was overwhelming with all this service. She used to help dad a lot in his service. And she used to go visitation, very long hours visitation, uh, hospitals. Uh, she was his directory. She used to have the use, the directory, the paper one, and she used to direct him left, right, and but um, yeah, I missed uh, that uh, luxury in Egypt where you um, you have a, a nanny, and she wasn't very old either, and uh, she's very close to the kind of um, the family because mum raised her from a very young age, so even before I was born, she was there with mum. So she was very close to the family and she knew everything and mum could trust her and she leave her with us. But here we, uh, when we came, there was nothing like this. Everybody has to do their own stuff. So it was a, it's a change and it's a challenge, but hmm. God help, we we'll overcome. <laughs> yeah. It is a hard, difficult, yeah. but then we went, um, back um, to Egypt for a holiday uh, with my dad and mum and my brothers. That was the first time I went on holiday. And I was going, well, no, I think I like Australia better. Because <laughs> it was too full, <laughs> crowded, it was hot. So uh, I realised this is, you know, this is our home now and we settled. 
So if other men would have asked a lot of help from the community in terms of legalities and finances and establishing and procedures and government help, he would have organised all that. Yes. Did he ever ask his children, you being one of them, to help with anything, even if it's around the home or to help a member of the community, another student that would have been your age? Not really. He used to do it all in his, by himself. And mum used to kind of, as she said, she's um, to help the newcomers. We had overwhelmed every day there's a new face in our house till they settle and goodbye, you know. Every day there's a lot, a lot of people because as I said, dad used to go to the airport, no more ships, he used to go to the airport and there's enormous people, they come in one day. Some of them, they had a previous family, they go with them, but at least they see the first impression when they get out of the airport, I realize that when you go to a different country and you know absolutely nothing. You're just going there. As soon as they see dad, I think they feel more comfortable. Mm. I've got somebody here that I know, I can mm. trust. So they go straight to him and he used to arrange for their accommodation. It was very easy, but still, you don't know how to go, whom to ask. So he used to do all these things because he knew who's coming today, who's coming next week. Who's, so he had a list and uh, I think Bishop Samuel used to I send faxes or letters and tell him that these families are coming and that's the name and the number of the family. So there was a good communication between that and the bishop, uh, the late Bishop Samuel, of uh, the families that they're coming and uh, what are their requests. And he used to tell mom, we've got another, a few families, they need to go to um, schools, they need to find some work, shopping. Someone used to show them where is the shopping. It was very local, everything by walking, so it wasn't really hard. That's great. Mm. So all the work that Father Mina did, of course, um, was a huge amount. And looking mm. back, it's incredible to see what he achieved in his by lifetime. Himself, yes. And on his own a lot of the time. Yes. So his health started to, to take a bit of a toll, I think, from all the work that he did. How, how did you cope? I know you would have been a lot older by then, but how did you cope knowing your dad started to get sick and overworked and things like that? Well, we used to kind of try to offer if there's anything that we can do. Lately, uh, we used to drive him to church and he would refuse to stay at uh, his house. Even after his sickness, he wouldn't stay. He'd say, no, I would rather stay in the church. I don't want to stay here. Mm -hmm. So he had a, a dialysis as well. And then he had uh, the other, uh, the bag one, and it used to get infected because he used to change it at the church and um, it didn't go well. Although we do, yes, clean our hands with the antiseptic, but it didn't go well. So finally he, he asked Pop Corollis, he said, I had enough. If you know, uh, yeah, you wanna do something, uh, please do something. And on the same night, uh, the phone rang and they said, I will find you a kidney if you can come over and um, we'll start the procedure, so. It was really you know, a blessing from God, but uh, yeah, even the government um, also recognized him and they gave him the orders of me uh, medal because I think he was the first one and everybody um, was anxious to find out who is he and where does he come from. So he, we got a lot of people from the street, they stop him and say, where are you from, what church do you belong to? So he kind of preached as he went because of his outfit. Um, People can tell that he is not from here. And are you staying here? And so a lot of people uh, knew about the Coptic church because of the way dad dressed and he used to go to a lot of hospital. So a lot of people used to uh, ask him, even in the hospital, the nurses or the patient that they, uh, the visitors, mm -hmm. they ask. So everybody had a kind of awareness uh, without even him speaking about himself, they used to, you know, when something unusual happened, people ask. So he used to kind of answer and had the time and to chat to them and to tell them where he come from and what's his church like. So, and then finally they got recognized by the government and we had a, a very nice uh, celebration with, uh, with everybody, our community and uh, all the members of, uh, uh, some of the members of parliament and uh, some of the fathers that were here and we hold a function in his honour and that was really great, something at least, you know, they can be recognised. Mm. So that's from 
the government point of view, but the church has recognized him too quite well. And they used to do lots of, um, a, 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 like a celebration or even some choir and recognize his, uh, his work, especially at uh, Archangel Michael and St. Bishaw. You had a beautiful group of youth that they, um, uh, they had uh, a choir and say uh, things about him and his uh, work. And I think it was very nice of them to do that, but something to be recognized. And I'm sure now he's very recognized up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So his achievements were not only recognized in the Egyptian community, but the Australian community, as yes. you mentioned, the Order of Australia Medal and many dignitaries that he also met with. Um, yes, I all the function, the Egyptian yes. embassy, the, all the um, other um, churches, whether it's Catholic or Anglican, they always used to get in contact with him. Had uh, a bishop, Bishop Bit Heather, he used to come even as a, a personal friend, he used to come and visit my dad and he used to talk about things about the churches because there's a few ch uh, children who goes to the Catholic Church and um, they used to, talk, you know, like as a friend and uh, he used to kind of like what dads think about this. Mm -hmm. So he used to come and has, uh, hear his opinion about a few things. Yeah. Very well loved man, a yes. very reputable man, absolutely. And yes, his yes. legacy and his memory will live on. Very proud of him. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Yvonne, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. It's been wonderful chatting with you.